or when we get to questions, you could just pull the yeah. mic off and we yep. don't have it sitting here. And we can yeah. Pass it out. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, we better ask. What day is the one in Sydney? Um, I can put in a January second. I can put in a plug for that too, quick. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and get started tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for coming up here to Ponca tonight. Uh, my name's Lucas Negus, the Northeast District Manager with the Wildlife Division out of Norfolk. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks for everybody for turning in online as well if you're watching. Um, kind of the way it's gonna go tonight, I got a, a presentation here that's gonna go over some deer biology, um, some of our harvest statistics and also some of our uh, philosophies and such that we use for managing deer primarily and we'll touch on some of the other big games such as pronghorn and elk as well. Um, some introductions first, uh, we have Commissioner Jim Ernst who came up from Columbus tonight, so thanks Jim. Our new big game program manager Luke Maduna uh, just started here a few weeks ago. Our wildlife, what's that? Last Monday. Last Monday was his first day but he's been with the Game and Parks Commission for several years before that. Wildlife Division Administrator Alicia Harden is with us tonight. And then we have a host of uh, conservation officers and biologists, the Parks Division folks too, that uh, have showed up tonight to support and help answer questions. So Adam Brockman's up here at Ponca, Scott Wessels, uh, District Manager out of Norfolk as well, Grant Weimer, Chris Wood, uh, oh, Jason Teal, Russ Hamer, a biologist at our station throughout Northeast Nebraska work either with private landowners or on our public lands. Um, conservation officers Jeff Jones and Owen Johnson uh, from up here in the very northeast part of the state are with us. Uh, Brady Johnson, Jeff Fields, and Scott Oligmuller are with the Ponca State Park and thanks for uh, hosting us tonight. They've put a lot of work into this facility. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, if you see, if you have any questions as we're going through these slides, go ahead and ask them if it's pertinent to that, that, that uh, particular slide in case you forget it. Otherwise, we will have questions and comments at the end of the meeting. And we also have questions that were submitted online that we're gonna go through and answer those as well. So here we go. In Nebraska, our deer management goal overall philosophy is to provide quality hunting and viewing opportunities within the limits of the deer resource while maintaining deer numbers at a level that is within the limits of social and ecological tolerance. Uh, a pretty challenging goal to manage within the social and ecological tolerance because there's such a wide uh, degree of, of, of difference between those uh, tolerances. Even from neighbor to neighbor that can vary quite a bit. Um, a little bit of biology I'm going to go over. Uh, 
particularly with white-tailed deer, they uh, persist statewide, although eastern Nebraska is their, their most prevalent habitat in Nebraska. Uh, as you get more towards the western part of the state, they're going to exist in the, the river systems and the wooded type areas. Um, they have high productivity. They, uh, many, most probably breed as fawns, so the, this year's fawns that are six, seven mo months old are going to be breeding uh, right now into January. Uh, those, those fawns typically have a single fawn, the older does have twins, and I say sometimes triplets, it's probably quite often have triplets with, uh, with the good health of the herd. <coughs> uh, as most, most of us know, uh, kind of the breeding timeline is bucks start going into rut, you know, late October, early November here in this part of Nebraska. The peak of the rut is, varies generally year to year, but generally mid-November-ish. It uh, kind of lags off a little bit as November goes on, picks up once again in, in December, mid-December when those fawns go into estrus. Mule deer is a little bit different. Um, they're primarily limited to the western two-thirds of the state of Nebraska. Uh, they're primary, primarily grassland or coniferous species. And um, they're less productive. They rarely breed as fawns. They usually have single or twin fawns. Uh, the breeding biology is a tiny bit different. They go into rut, to rut a little bit later. Is that correct, Luke? Mule deer typically go into rut a little bit later. Yep. And, and they're not as productive. Um, the reason we go through this is when we go into our season, season setting guidelines, recommendations, permit quotas, you have to take account of their biology um, into account as you're, as you're developing quotas, regulations, and season lengths, that type of stuff. Um, input to deer management comes from four primary sources here in Nebraska. Um, landowners, hunters, the general public, and then us at the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Uh, we can provide the production, the mortality, disease, age structure, harvest, data trends, that type of stuff. We, we rely on input from the landowners, hunters, and the public in the more general senses of what they're seeing, what they're, what they're out there harvesting, uh, other comments and stuff. Um, us at the Game and Parks Commission, our responsibilities include developing permits and seasons to manage deer in a responsible and biological sound manner. We provide regulation and policies to assist landowners in controlling deer within tolerable limits, and that varies landowner to landowner, region to region. And we provide equal opportunities for hunters within the framework of management goals and strategies. <clears throat> now, as, as landowners here in Nebraska, you also have the responsibilities to estimate your deer population as best you can. Uh, if a population is too high, ask uh, hunters or, or increase antlerless harvest yourself. Give access to hunters you can trust. If you lease your property to hunters, require an antlerless harvest if your population is too high in your eyes. Work with neighbors in achieving common deer management goals. Now the hunters also have similar responsibilities that you work with the landowner you hunt on to manage deer numbers and quality at, for, to benefit both. Harvest the antlerless deer if population reduction is desired. Harvest deer ethically and responsibly. If you have surplus deer to your needs that you've harvested, consider uh, sur uh, har donating them uh, in the deer exchange program, hunters helping the hungry, local needy families, etc. And then also mentor and recruit new, new hunters, whether that be family members or non-family members. Uh, keep the hunting tradition going as well as we can. Uh, this question is asked often. We do have an, a Game and Parks deer damage policy. <clears throat> and this is to help assist our landowners out there because we do live in an agricultural setting. Um, hunting is number one, the preferred method to reduce damage um, from white-tailed mule deer, any type of big game. However, hunting doesn't always work. There's always extenuating, there can be extenuating circumstances, we all know that, um, and we do have uh, areas where we do have agricultural damage. Um, in that case, we, we go through a series of levels in assessing, the, assessing what we can do to help or what can be done. Um, first, uh, somebody may call in, have some concerns, we, may, we take the phone call when we visit in person and on site to, to assess the situation. Um, 
We, we first look at fencing or habitat modifications, maybe scare devices, uh, physical methods and means to deter the damage uh, from that uh, crop, certain crop. If those methods aren't going to work, we do have the ability to, amp to, to uh, give out a damage permit. Folks might know them as a kill permit or a depredation permit. Um, those are no fee permits. However, there are guidelines that we follow. The landowner must allow reasonable harvest of antlerless deer, and that has to be occurring during our hunting seasons. Kill permits are not issued for property leased exclusively for buck hunting. Outside of the 123 deer season, 123 day deer season is when those permits are issued. Typically in the eastern part of Nebraska, our deer damage permits are on crop damage, which is occurring in uh, July and August. So our damage permits often occur in August, but some of them also are issued later in January on, in certain situations. Um, uh, while the landowner is issued the permits, he can have agents or shooters uh, getting, collecting or shooting the deer for him. Those shooters must be approved by the Game and Parks Commission, pre-approved. And most importantly, all deer must be utilized. Um, they're simply not shot and discarded. They need to be utilized or given, given away. Uh, the number of permits issued is on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and we, biologists, conservation officers, and other people involved make that determination with the landowner. Deer refuges in, this, in our part of the state are the primary source of many depredation problems. Uh, we don't typically have huge land holdings, so some landowners, some folks allow a lot of hunting and others don't. And uh, so deer populations vary from one property to another, and oftentimes causes uh, depredation issues with neighbors. <clears throat> We're gonna get into some considerations we go through when it comes to setting our deer seasons. Um, for our deer seasons, we, we manage based on harvest trends. We don't know the exact population of deer, specifically white-tailed deer in Nebraska. So we do our management based on trends as far as the data we collect. Um, so we go with harvest information and data, and I'll get into that a little bit more here. We do hunter and landowner surveys periodically. We take public comments at information meetings. At meetings like tonight, we're writing down questions and comments. We take those into considerations. We keep track of our crop damage complaints, disease occurrences throughout the state, definitely, uh, certain weather conditions, and vehicle accidents to some extent. <clears throat> um, when we get together, some of the population trend indicators from the harvest that we look at include the adult male harvest, which would be buck harvest, antlerless harvest, so uh, we look at that more and more all the time, especially with whitetails when it comes to our, our populations, whether they're increasing or decreasing. Uh, the percentage of one and a half and two and a half and older bucks in the harvest, and the percent success by permit. We look at those individually and in combination to try to determine uh, where the, the deer herd stands and whether or not permit uh, quota should be increased, decreased, or stay the same, and there's various combinations and ways to look at that. <clears throat> A little bit of harvest summary from 2018. Uh, this is preliminary. Most of this is based on our firearm deer season. We have uh, nearly all of our information back from that, and we can make some preliminary uh, uh, we can make some preliminary decisions on that. But we're still, you know, uh, in the middle of muzzleloader season. Archery season is still going. We still have season choice and uh, river antlerless uh, antlerless only seasons. So uh, overall. As of the end of January, or end of November, our overall, overall harvest was down 5% in the state. Uh, here in Northeast Nebraska, we're only down not quite even 1%. So we're, uh, our harvest in Northeast Nebraska was standing up pretty well, and that's simply compared to last year. Whitetail buck harvest was up slightly statewide uh, with 41% of those three and a half or older bucks. That's the age. Uh, mule deer buck harvest was down slightly, but still the second harvest, second highest harvest uh, since we've kept record. And 59% uh, of those bucks were, 50, were three and a half or older bucks. So that's just a general age structure. Uh, as I mentioned here in Northeast Nebraska, although it varies region to region, even in the, in the Northeast part of the state, uh, our harvest was very similar to last year. So, so far. Yep. How's it compare with the 10 year running average before any 
Yeah, I'd have to look at that a little more closely. I don't know offhand how it, he asked how it compared to the 10 year average overall harvest, yeah. I think the whites up here are like two, about two thirds of what you were. Yeah, and I have some, it's, he says probably about two thirds. I'll get it, I have a graph here that'll probably show that a little more closely. In fact, there it is right there. So here we are right here, uh, actually. This is from 1970 to 2017. I just want to show this to indicate um, many of you remember back in the 70s and 80s when it was a, you could only get a deer permit generally once every two years. It was a draw every year and a lot of them were buck only permits. You were lucky if you got even an either or permit. So things have changed drastically since about the early to mid 90s. Uh, we had a little reset here. We all remember 2012, uh, a little reset in the harvest, but uh, it's, it's, it is recovering. Uh, this one's a little easier to see. We're about, uh, about two thirds about uh, before uh, 2012. Although I think most people agree before 2012, we were walking the line on deer populations. Great for hunters, but we also had a lot of conflicts uh, with, other, with other aspects of that deer population. So uh, in this graph, I should explain that better. This is the whitetail buck harvest, uh, this blue line here. This is our whitetail antlerless harvest. Uh, the only time we were able to achieve more antlerless harvest than buck harvest in Nebraska is when we had earn a buck in our Elkhorn, Missouri, and Wahoo units. Um, if you remember those, that particular uh, permit, you had to harvest or check in a doe before or with your buck. And that was how we were able to achieve uh, more antlerless harvest. We had high deer populations. And before we got a chance to fully determine if it was going to be effective or not, EHD uh, took care of the, the situation naturally. Our mule deer harvest, mule deer buck harvest, relatively static over the years. Um, we're we're a last two years record harvest, nearing 10,000 mule deer harvested in the state, which is good, and real high quality mule deer as well. Um, we're going to go over some deer management unit summaries for 2018 as well, uh, relative to the northeast part of the state here. So here's our deer, our deer unit map in Nebraska. Uh, relatively large units. Um, they're historically uh, made units. They're sub, uh, they are split into subunits in some cases for our season choice permits, but uh, these, these uh, traditional units have maintained their typical size. Uh, units we're going to talk about tonight are Missouri, we're right up here in the northeast part of the state, Elkhorn, Loop East, and Calamus East. Um, just go over those real quickly with some statistics from those for this year. Some of the season changes for our 2018 permits. In the Missouri unit, we added antlerless only whitetail bonus tags to the firearm permits, and we removed the antlerless mule deer restriction on those firearm permits. In the Elkhorn unit, we removed the antlerless mule deer restriction, and we also reduced the season choice uh, antlerless tags by 800 permits in the unit. In the Calamus East unit, um, the, the deer seem to be doing well out there. We increased general permits by 150 and added bonus tags, white to only bonus tags, to every permit in that unit. And we also added 200 season choice permits in that unit. And then the Loop East, we increased permits by 300 and they all have a bonus tag on them in the Loop East unit. Um, the Loop East unit may, it has one of the highest whitetail populations in the state uh, right now, from what we can gather by our trend data and our observations anyway. Do you usually sell out of all your permits? Uh, she asked if we usually sell out of our permits and that's on a unit by unit basis. In the nor Northeast here, we do typically sell out of our permits. Um, some of our units, uh, we don't sell out of all the permits. Um, we don't sell out of all the season choice or antlerless only permits. In the Missouri unit, we didn't sell out. If we did, it's just been over the last few days. Um, the Loop East unit, we don't sell out of our season choice permits, which indicates that the, you know, the demand isn't there for all those permits. <coughs> In the Missouri unit, this is a kind of another look back in time as how the unit has progressed for harvest. This is what we call the all kill. So this is all deer harvested in the unit throughout all seasons. Um, so this is in 2000, the last one here formally is 2017. This year we've harvested so far 2,146 bucks compared to 2,208. 
uh, all of last year. So by the time muzzleloader and archery seasons end here, uh, we'll probably have a similar, if not more, buck harvest in Missouri unit. We did harvest more does this year in Missouri unit than last year. Does your whitetail buck numbers here, is that strictly yep. male deer? Or does that include the like either or tags? Are they actually yep. split yep. by sex with it? Yes. No, this is by harvest. So this is deer in the whitetail buck, adult whitetail bucks in the harvest. Yep. Yep. And this would be antlerless deer, so that would include any deer, um, all does, and then any deer with with no any buck deer with no antlers. So, but. What's the feed structure of your bucks? Is yep. Compared to statewide. Yep. They all get to that in a second with a slide. So, yep. Thank you. It's a good question. Yep. In the Elkhorn unit, Elkhorn historically um, has been a, deer, a unit with a fairly high deer population, but a, a kind of an interesting one to manage with our buck structure. Um, again, we're, we're having a, a decent year in the Elkhorn unit. We've stabilized since the, uh, since the drop in 2012. This year we, uh, we've harvested less bucks, 2041 versus 2328 um, last year, so a little reduction in, uh, in the buck harvest in the Elkhorn unit. We'll see where that ends up after our seasons uh, finish up here. How does that work with the, on that elk horn with the Indian reservation? Yep. With the reservation permits? Uh, well, they, they have I mean, their... Do you figure out, do you figure they use that uh, information also? No, we do not include their permit information so with ours. they could be selling a lot more deer and there wouldn't be no... Yeah, we don't, we don't keep track of what they have in their harvest, I guess. Yep. Calamus East, you can see uh, that's a little bit different trend. It's not taking quite so long, apparently, for it to recover from, uh, from our EHD event, DHD event in 2012. Um, uh, we're very close to harvest of bucks last year that we were, or this year that we were last year. And our whitetail antlerless harvest has stabilized. We put bonus tags on the firearm permits to try to, uh, to increase that antlerless harvest we know uh, we're pretty, pretty sure that we have a growing uh, whitetail population in the Calamus East unit. We want to make sure that that doesn't get, uh, get up there too fast. And then Loop East, uh, we receive a fair number of uh, crop damage complaints. Uh, we have a lot of deer in the Loop East unit. We're attempting to harvest does in that unit to reduce the population. Our buck, our buck harvest is high, continues to be high this year and uh, the buck quality is good um, but again it's a it's a unit that we just need to try to keep on top of as far as our antlerless harvest goes um, here's some success rates just overall rates and you can see how these vary unit to unit in the elkhorn we're consistently you know in the 39 to 42 per percent success uh, sometimes it gets a little higher sometimes a little lower um, the Elkhorn unit is kind of a tougher one to, to figure out, I guess, just simply put. Calamus East unit, we always have fairly high success rates. Um, same with Missouri and Loop East. Uh, those are units that have high success rates. Um, and the bonus tags kind of throw off the, the success rates. We are able to tease that out um, when we dig a little deeper. But uh, generally, it's probably 11 to 13% lower than the actual because of the bonus tag so here's our buck this is the Missouri unit um, age structure of the bucks in the harvest year to year it goes back to 2004 the blue line which the colors aren't showing up as well on here as I would like the blue line is the year is the age class of one and a half year old bucks the red line is two and a half year old bucks, and the purple line is three and a half year old bucks here. You can see an oscillation between the year and a half old and two and a half year old bucks, or a year and a half and three and a half year old bucks. Our two and a half year old bucks are always uh, well represented in our harvest, and the three and a half year old bucks are pretty well represented with being, you know, generally in that 30 or higher percent range of three and a half year old bucks. And then, uh, you know, 45 and 30, 75. Close to 80% of the bucks in the harvest are two and a half or older in the Missouri unit. Um, our goal is generally 60 to 65%. Uh, 
uh, two and a half or older. So, right? Yep. Our goal. Yep. Yeah. So you can see the trend in our last, in the last 15 years. This is our year and a half old bucks. You know, back in the early 2000s, you can see that that trend has gone clear down. It used to be 60% of the deer in the Missouri unit and nearly all our units were, were year and a half old bucks or older or younger. And so that trend is reversed. Uh, deer populations, hunter selection, many factors have played into that, but uh, we have a, a very, uh, feel pretty comfortable with our age trends right now in, in the Missouri unit. Uh, it's going to look, look a little different in this next slide in the Elkhorn unit. Here's our three and a half year old bucks down here in the Elkhorn unit. Uh, traditionally year and a half and two and a half year old bucks in the Elkhorn unit have played a big part of the harvest. <clears throat> um, Luke would have to speak more to that. I'm not sure why that is in the Elkhorn unit. It's like Elkhorn and Wahoo unit traditionally have uh, high, high numbers of year and a half old and, and two and a half year old bucks in the harvest. Some of that is just uh, proximity to higher population of people. Yep. Um, there's, just, there's just more pressure on them. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, if you didn't hear, Luke said some of that is just simply proximity to, to high pressure deer hunting, uh, more people out hunting in the, in the eastern, eastern units. You got a question quick? Mm-hmm. Yep. They, yeah, th I should mention this aging information is from all biologist uh, man stations. So not all the check stations have a biologist at them, but the only aging information we included are aged deer by the biologist. So, yep, that's a good point though that Yeah, we target the, the busy check stations to get the most deer age that we can. Um, that's not saying that there are check stations that need improvement, you know. Calamus East unit is another good, good unit for older class deer. Two and a half and three year old, three and a half year old bucks uh, make up 80% of the, the harvest according to our, to our aging. Again, it's a more rural area, larger land holdings. In the Loop East unit, even with high deer harvest and uh, high deer numbers, we maintain a, a very good age structure, 70, 70 or 75 percent of the bucks are two and a half years old and, and older in Nebraska in the Loop East unit. <clears throat> a lot of that is also related to sheer deer numbers. Um, if there's more deer out there, there's more bucks out there, there's more bucks that are going to survive to be older. So some of that's just pure, pure number, the number of deer out there. Um, just pop up archery success quick. Um, you can see throughout the years, archery success maintains, con maintains pretty consistency between 20 and 24%. Uh, this year, as of today, I checked, uh, we we're at about 21.5% success this year. That's still going to change a little bit. We have a couple weeks for people to buy permits and a couple weeks for people to harvest deer yet. So um, that'll change a little bit. And then this, I think, surprises some folks. Our muzzleloader success is still in that same uh, success rate range. And currently we're at 18% success, although you know folks will be hitting it hard over the holidays with their muzzleloaders yet. So that'll change and probably increase a little bit. We'll see where that ends up. Uh, we take into account disease events. Uh, 2012 was a, bit, was a good example of how disease can affect a deer season and a deer herd. Um, this year, no EHD was confirmed or reported in this part of the state anyway, which is good. And it's not unexpected with the wet conditions. Um, 
Chronic wasting disease, uh, that's been, you, you've noticed our press releases lately, our, we got our results back in Nebraska from our testing. Uh, we, we sampled for chronic wasting disease in the western, northwestern part of the state, and then also the units uh, down the middle of the state, the Kiapaha, Calamus West, and Loop West. Um, of 1,208 deer tested, 131 were positives. Uh, we selectively tested deer, uh, picked them out at the check stations. We wanted, uh, we targeted bucks that were two and a half year old, years old or older um, to get the bet they are, uh, and I'm not an expert on CWD, but they have the best uh, representation of, of having the CWD prion, correct? Yeah, there, there, there's been research to show that, that older bucks tend to, uh, they're, it's three to five times more likely to carry CWD than like the equivalent of age doe, and a lot of that's just because of the, the social nature of the animals. So we targeted bucks in an effort to get, if there's CWD out there, to get it in our samples to, to locate it. Um, we'd had the first reported cases of chronic wasting disease in Valley and Kippaha, and Kippaha counties. Uh, the Valley one, County one was near uh, west of Ord and the Kippaha one was close to Valentine. And so um, the rest of these 130 positives were primarily in the Pine Ridge and Plains unit, Pine Ridge unit uh, considerably, and then the Sand Hills unit had, had 13 or 14 positives as well. Um, I put this up here. We have an excellent website uh, uh, web page in conjunction with our website on chronic wasting disease. There's links to external websites about the disease. It's a hot, a hot subject now nationwide. Um, so I encourage folks, if you're interested, to take a look at that website and do some research on that because chronic wasting disease is, a, is a, an interesting disease in, in itself. So. Men in, oh. Uh, Jeff asked, any tuberculosis located here? Um, no reports in the last couple years. Um, we do monitor uh, rib cages and then hunters with concerns that while they're gutting, we do take, uh, take note of that, but no confirmed tuberculosis cases, fortunately. And that's in, that's in cattle or, or deer. Meningeal brain worm uh, is a, a brain worm that is found, found in whitetails naturally. It affects mule deer uh, in high enough concentration. It, it kills mule deer. Uh, we do have five confirmations in mule deer in Knox, Brown, and Boyd County so far this year. Uh, that can be concerning. It was in 2009 or 10. There was a, an outbreak, if you can call it an outbreak, of, of brain worm in mule deer in central Nebraska that likely did have a population effect. So. That's something we keep an eye on, especially in the fringe, uh, fringe borders of our mule deer populations um, because it can affect the mule deer herd. So we keep an eye on that. Uh, the symptoms of that is a mule deer that, uh, one of the primary symptoms that people notice, the mule deer that is lethargic, doesn't respond to you, and then they'll start walking in tight circles because of the neurological damage the brain worm causes. Uh, just a graph representation of roadkill deer in Nebraska. Here's Nebraska down here, you know, in the 10, about 5,000 deer per year. Um, goes up, look at Kansas and Iowa, still have fairly good numbers, but you get out east where there's more deer, more cars, and more people, there's Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. You know, Pennsylvania generally has more roadkill deer than we have hunter harvested deer in our whole state of Nebraska. So it's an interesting uh, graph. <clears throat> Um, a few other items, uh, we'd like to continue the deer exchange program uh, in our, where we want uh, antlerless harvest. One of the common, uh, common comments we get is we just, we'd like to harvest those, we just don't have a room for all of them. Where can we get, where can we donate them? So we have a uh, deer exchange program on the internet, which that simply links hunters with folks that are looking for deer. Um, encourage participation in hunters helping the hungry. Um, we continue to need monetary contributions, um, deer contributions, and locker participation. Uh, it's a great program if we can just uh, keep it going and keep expanding it. Uh, just a little bit quick on, on pronghorn harvest. Uh, nearest to us is the Eastern Sand Hill, East Sand Hills unit uh, for pronghorn. Traditional, it's a huge unit with, that's hard to determine the number of antelope out there just because its size, its uh, expansive nature. Um, 
antelope roam a lot. You know, back in 2009, we had 24 permits. Uh, an EHD outbreak in pronghorn kind of prompted the reduction of permits. Um, we've had indications in the past several years that maybe there's more pronghorn out there again than we, we originally thought. So we increased permits this year back up to 24, uh, 16 regular and eight landowners. Um, they harvested 16 buck pronghorn with those firearm permits. And then um, another somewhat surprising uh, harvest was that they harvested 16 or 17 other pronghorn with archery and muzzle loaders in the East Sandhills unit, which uh, basically doubled the harvest over from last year. So that's interesting. We're going to have to visit that East Sandhills unit uh, in, the, in the future here to determine uh, what, uh, what that's looking like for us. Um, a quick question here, if anybody is interested, uh, we're kind of far east here, but the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission would like to hear your thoughts on landowner pronghorn permits. Do you have any thoughts on restructuring the pronghorn permit in regards to what lands a permit holder may hunt on? Cur currently one is restricted to land uh, he or she owns. Another option may be to, provide to, to hunt any private land within the permit unit that is valid. Is there any thoughts or other thoughts on how that may work? Correct. That's is one thing. Is there a minimum for land they have to own, or can yes. somebody that owns a house in Chatter get a landowner yeah. permit? It's, uh, it's, what's the acreage on a pronghorn? Is it 160 acres now? Yeah, I, I have to look for sure, but I believe the acre, it's like a deer landowner permit where you have to have a minimum acreage for agricultural, per, or a minimum acreage or lease for agricultural purposes. Uh, Yeah, I'm not sure what the rationale yeah, what, would be. The, is, it was the, a, issue, the issue is, yeah. is people that have antelope and animal damage at a part of the year that the, that the season has to Yep. The, so the issue would be um, antelope are somewhat migratory or at least seasonally migratory. So some folks have damage a part of the year, and then when season comes, there's no pronghorn on their property. And I believe that would be one solution to attempt to address that. That's just uh, one solution. Okay, good comment. And they're not allowed to sell those permits, right? Correct. No, these are not transferable or sellable permits. They're still a permit that they would buy yep, and use themselves. Yep. Okay. And then, real quick, our state elk harvest for 2018. Um, our closest elk unit up here is Boyd, the Boyd unit, which is a couple hours west of here. We issue six permits in the Boyd unit, uh, three cow and three bull. Uh, this year they harvested three cows um, and no bulls. Uh, last year they did harvest two cows and three bull, or two bulls and three cows. So um, it's, that, that herd is a little unique in that it travels back and forth into South Dakota. Um, and so some years the elk are in Nebraska and other years they're in, in South Dakota. It varies year to year. Uh, the last two years they have apparently have been in Nebraska during our elk season. Um, the other closest one is the Niobrara River unit. Uh, we, we increased permits this year in the Niobrara River. We, inc we added uh, three bull permits and uh, several cow tags as well. Um, they filled all nine bull tags and are up to, I think we're up to 13 cows harvested in that unit right now. So um, that's a growing, as far as we can tell, it is an expanding elk herd there in the Niobrara unit as well. Other elk uh, throughout the success throughout the other elk units. Um, last year we had 87 percent success statewide on bulls, this year 87 percent. So uh, uh, as you know an elk, an elk permit is once in a lifetime harvest of a bull and if, you, if you're lucky enough to get a permit then you're, you're going to have a good chance at harvesting a bull. So that's good. Yes? What if you do not harvest a bull? Yeah, if you do not harvest a bull you are eligible uh, to, to apply for bull permits again. Uh, Luke, do you have to wait on that? I can't remember on that. Yeah, we'd have to check with that and get back to you on that. So. I was yep. heard by a few people that have to wait three years, and some people say you got to wait five years. I think oh. you have to wait five. Yep. What's the reasoning yep. for that? Uh, yep. so, that the, so that the people 
people that have drawn or drawn sit out while everybody else has had their had the, hasn't had an opportunity. Yeah. It's a, opportunity to draw. It's a, to give opportunity to those folks that haven't drawn uh, to to a chance to draw over the years between then. So. Okay, landowner pronghorn is actually 80 acres. Okay, that's it for the formal part of the presentation. Now uh, we'll take questions and comments. I don't know if I mentioned this, but we are writing these questions and comments down. Uh, they'll be uh, written around, spread around. We, we evaluate those as we determine our, our big game recommendations. Just a little timeline for you. Um, we have deer, elk, pronghorn seasons running through mid-January. In the meantime, uh, statewide we're busy uh, going through crunching the numbers that we have already. Um, as soon as January 15th hits, um, statewide a group of people, uh, biologists, district managers, conservation officers start really putting their heads together and already developing uh, seasons and permit quotas for 2019. Um, for several days in the first part of February, we get together and try to hash it all out, provide a recommendation for seasons and permit quota to our commissioners, and I believe it's the April meeting, is that right? That they, they, uh, they review those recommendations and give the yay or nay on those big game recommendations. So between now and then is when folks have an opportunity to make comments, questions, and that type of, of, uh, of opportunity to get your, your opinions out there. Yes, question? Um, he had, the question was if Telecheck is an out-of-state contractor for pronghorn. Uh, our Telecheck is for all species that are run by the same, uh, same uh, company. Yeah, it, it's, it's out of South Carolina. It's out of South Carolina, yes. And I've had trouble with that. You've had trouble they, with that? They okay. don't know the difference between archery and firearm. Okay. That's something we'll. It's, it's yeah. really hard to find contractors for that. There's not many businesses that do that. Those call centers. Yeah, yeah but there's a number of issues to deal with. Yeah. Why was the reason we went to build a check? Why can't some of those checks, why can't a check station be open the entire season? Uh, I mean, I know you have a big rush yeah. during the fire. But it would, be, would it be that hard for that check station to keep the papers there for the entire season? Um, I guess historically I'm not real 100% certain what that change was made. I know some of it was con simply hunter convenience. Um, yeah, convenience, yeah. Uh, money, manpower. Yeah. Um, there's some places that operate as check stations that aren't normally open 8 to 8 mm -hmm. every day. And it's, so um, trying, to, trying to work with it, it was, it's, a huge, it's a huge investment on our part and just ways to be more efficient as well, like you mentioned. Yep. Be, be more um, accommodating for the hunters. Cause there's, there's some places that it's 30 miles to a check station. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's hard to ask hunters to drive that far, but it takes you here. And with, with technology, it's actually gotten better besides a phone call. Many folks check in their deer with their their smartphone or their tablet at the site of harvest, you know, so, yeah. Has there ever been any thought to start maybe a youth firearm season in October to try to get the kids out and get them before it's butt cold with rifles and stuff? Yeah. Is, is that something that might be a possibility, a, a youth to try to manage numbers in some of those areas and stuff? Um, it's, it gets yeah. brought up and I think it's, it's been discussed and I, that was before I was part of some of these discussions. I don't, yeah. I don't know the details. Kids who we've sent them all through Hunter's Dad and want them to stick around and hunt in Nebraska. Biggest thing I hear no place to hunt, no way to go with. Mm -hmm. We can find them better, but finding the land is a little different. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm scared that somebody in this room just 
day older than they were yesterday. <laughs> What's coming up? They're losing interest. Yeah. Is there anything that can be addressed on that? I don't think those are good comments, and that's we we talk about it often. And, and I w I don't know that we have good answers yet, you know. But I, I like you. I hope we can find some answers because access, especially in the eastern part of the state, is a hard hard one to tackle. But I will commend you for five dollar tag deal. That's, okay. that's a great addition. Get a five dollar tax for kids from even out of space. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a great program. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In our, our open fields and waters program with our Atlas, we've, we've been investing a lot in that over the last few years. I, I, I don't know the, the numbers of how much more we've spent in probably the last five years, but it's it's it's, yep. it's really significant. We've, we've increased those acres a lot. Mm -hmm. I know in Wyoming. Okay, we have a host of questions as well from online that we're going to go through quickly here too. Okay. Luke is going to come up and handle those too. So. All right, I can read some of these so that our uh, YouTube audience um, can hear them as well. All right, um, one of them's from uh, R. Calhoun. Uh, talking about our CWD numbers, we just had our press release talking about our CWD. Uh, it says, in all the testing you've done previously, uh, infected populations over 18 years, we only found 500 cases in, um, with the numbers. We found 131 this year. I'm asking if that's correct or if it's a typo. Um, just asking what's going on. And he kind of addressed part of that. We're, we're targeting our sampling on, um, on animals that are more likely to to have CWD, which is more efficient um, ways to spend our money uh, on this, pro the, this project. It also gives us a better opportunity detecting it um, in, in areas uh, where we've not previously found it, like, like what we did in, in Kipaha and, and uh, Valley um, counties. And then uh, to kind of a follow-up there, uh, there's a Scott that asks what we're doing to uh, address the spread of CWD. Um, the biggest thing we're doing is just continuing to, to monitor it. Um, and oh, he's asking for more outlets for testing um, and to be at a reasonable price. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of labs or, or places to take that. UNL is our, our main one for that in the state right now. Um, um, historically, there, there, there was, there's a few areas. Um, a, a long time ago that that's not as much of an issue um, now it's just it's it tends to be more of a natural spread across the landscape um, whether it's animals uh, animal movement or our movement of carcasses um, is probably another likely vector for um, CWD movement oh this is good you won't hear it with this this is going to YouTube <laughs> sorry it doesn't help that I'm a little hoarse, too. <laughs> but does anybody else have any questions, or we'll, we'll get to grab another one from? To add on to CWD, we will be testing in northeast Nebraska these units next season. So um, be prepared. Uh, we collect those at our check stations. And uh, so yeah, we're on target for next year to collect in northeast Nebraska. All right, um, I think I counted in our online um, submissions, I think we had nine of them asking about moving our, the dates of our rifle season um, out of the rut. Uh, and that's, that's something that I, I, I expect that we'll, um, we'll have to address here in, in the future. Uh, we did a survey, I believe it was in 2015, of our deer hunters, and we, a, a majority of our deer hunters preferred that our, our rifle season stay where it is. 
Um, we're, I believe it's this year that we're doing another deer survey or a survey of our deer hunters, and I can guarantee that question will be on there again. Um, that's something that we'll, we'll continue taking the pulse of our, our hunters, um, where it is that they want it. A, a big part of that is that our rifle hunters really like being able to hunt deer during the rut, um, and you, you really can't blame them. Um, so that'll be, be something we continue to look at. Um, oh, Brian asked, uh, why are we giving bonus tags out on rifle season but not bow or muzzleloader? Um, a, a big part of that is we, we've still got pockets of the state where we don't have, um, we, we don't have bonus tags on all of our rifle units. We, we're not looking for additional doe harvest. Um, in some of those units, and so uh, we, we're, we're trying to, um, uh, I guess, minimize the impact of those statewide tags, trying to manage the harvest of those statewide tags by not including a, a, a bonus tag. And in some of those areas, are the, the existing season choice permits that we have are, are, are doing enough um, of our doe harvest to, to make up for it. We're not to the point where we're trying to um, really hammer down on the, the, po the doe populations. Yeah, and Lucas can probably talk to this yeah, a little more. Yeah, that's a good good comment because we've received comments throughout the year. Uh, this particularly far eastern part of the Missouri unit. Uh, he said his comment was in this particular area that uh, there does not appear to be a, a high population of does or deer in general, and that bonus tags at this point, additional bonus tags wouldn't be needed. Um, and so we've received several of those comments. Owen passes those on, you know, all the time when he gets those that the deer population is not. Uh, as high as, it, as most folks would like it to be in the in the unit. And Missouri unit is a, is a long unit east to west and changes quite a bit east to west, so we'll evaluate that. Um, parts of the unit there is a considerably higher population than there is right here, so we're, we're going to evaluate ways that we can address that. But, uh, that's a good comment, yes. I think last year when you guys brought the bonus tag yep. back on, that was a hard decision. Yeah, when we brought the bonus tag back on the Missouri unit last year, it was a hard decision, but we felt like uh, with the way the Missouri unit can expand in, in the, particularly the western two-thirds part of the unit, um, that, that bonus tag was, was needed. And that, the nice thing about the bonus tag is, um, generally speaking, the firearm hunters that are out there, if there's a lot of does to harvest, they'll typically harvest one. And if there's not, they don't use that bonus tag. It's a, that's the nice thing about the, um, typically speaking, the bonus tag. What's the ideal ratio of does to bucks is the question. That's uh, I don't know that there's a good answer to that. Um, everybody kind of touts that one to one. Um, when, when the higher the buck to doe ratio you get, you know, the more bucks per does you get, the, you get a more intense rut. Um, it's it's better for hunting. Uh, it's a more uh, the bucks travel a lot more. Um, fight a little harder when it when it's lower the bucks don't have to travel as as far to to find does um that's it's not something that we necessarily aim for uh in, in a lot of our management it's kind of a byproduct of of uh the accumulation of our uh management practices do you see a difference with the bonus tags of the number of does harvested as far as that goes or guys shooting more does than Uh, we gener we do see a, an increase in in the doe harvest when we have a bonus tag on our on our permits, um, particularly the, the the firearm permit, especially. In the areas you have the river unit where you just get the main doe tag, I think that you want. That's right. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, and, and that's part of it with the uh, with the river antler list tags, um, making those available. The, 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 those river corridors were where we had our main problems in the, uh, the late 2000s, um, you know, up to 2010, 2011, um, up until the EHD die off. And that, um, that permit has, has really helped us uh, maintain um, and, and manage the growth of our whitetail herds uh, in a lot of that. Well, and it's just it's diff different techniques to to get to get doe harvest on it. So. Okay, yeah, she, she read off a question off of the, the YouTube comments there um, about our non-resident prices. Um, that, that's, a, that's a comment that we get quite frequently, um, and I think there's a lot of us that, that would um, like to see that. That price increased. Um, it, it does provide a lot of opportunity for people to come to Nebraska. Um, but yeah, we definitely are um, less than, than most of our states uh, a lot of that's, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's set in statute. Alicia, yes, that's set in statute. So um, that would take uh, legislative action to um, increase that for us. Do you have more, more questions? Sure. Oh, I saw another question um, similar to some of the other questions that you were going, so we'll hit that one. Uh, why are antler restrictions, or have antler restrictions been considered to increase the age of bucks beyond two and a half in Nebraska? Um, a, a lot of the antler restrictions, the, the big uh, issue with, with antler restrictions, you've got to find a qualification within the antler structure that you can gauge age by. Um, and it's, we worked with UNK here uh, about five, six years ago. Um, where they did a bunch of structural measurements on, on whitetail deer and, and mule deer um, in Nebraska. And that is where our 11 inch um, measurement comes from, the inside spread that you, if, if you've done telecheck or at the check stations, they've got the little ruler um, to measure that inside spread. Um, that helps us get aged between one and a half and two and a half. But part of the issue with uh, antler restrictions is when you're trying to increase the, the, the age structure overall beyond those, you can definitely separate yearling from two and a half and older. Um, and he, as Lucas showed in a lot of our data, we don't really have a, a yearling buck harvest issue. A lot of states that go to antler restrictions are dealing with 70, 80, 90% yearling buck harvest. Statewide, we're, we're you know, around 20%, which is, is really pretty good, especially compared to um, across the nation. So if you start looking at you know, if you want to get, a, or, or let me take a step back. So when you do have antler restrictions, you take a lot of that pressure off of those yearling bucks, allowing them to get two and a half, but you transfer that hunting pressure directly onto that two and a half year old age class. And so you really generally don't add a whole lot of bucks that are three and a half, four and a half, five and a half years old because of um, those antler restrictions. And since there's really no way to have a, an antler restriction to only let people shoot five and a half year old deer. Um, that that's just the the limitations of antler restrictions. If you can't restrict antler restriction, why are we still allowing everybody to get two bucks? Then? Well, because we can we can support. The oh, yeah, sorry. He, the question from the audience is why do we if if we can't? Um, can you repeat that? <laughs> well, why is everybody allowed to get two bucks? Oh. And you know, not the residents. Everybody can shoot two bucks. I think yeah. That's a good question. He's asked, why do, why do we allow the harvest of two bucks? Why are we a two buck state? Um, I actually just crunched some, was crunching some numbers on that today. We were able to put a bunch of our harvest data with the permit data. And only, um, it's a shade over 2% of our resident hunters and 2.5% of our non-resident hunters harvest two bucks in the state. So in, in reality, it, it's a great opportunity for people to, to be able to shoot two bucks, um, but very a very low percentage of our hunters do it. I mean, we're like, well, I could pull it up. It's like 19 total hun 1900 total hunters. 
um, shoot two bucks. And so it, it, it just provides a great opportunity for our, our hunters. And, and again, with the, the age structure that he uh, showed, our age structure really does pretty good, um, you know, in, in spite of some of the limitations. You know, if you, if you compare our age structure to uh, some of the other um, uh, states, the QDMA um, puts out a great report uh, every year that's it's working off of last year's data. So the, the one they put out in 18 has got uh, 2016 data. Um, Iowa and Kansas don't report uh, their age structure, so we don't know um, to compare to those. But Nebraska's age structure is um, as good as or better in, in some instances than, than Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin. A lot of those traditional big buck states, we're right there with them. Um, not everything we see on TV is, is what's real on the ground. So. What about accreditation? What about our uh, We don't have a whole lot of information on, on our predators um, as far as what, what kind of impact they're having. Um, th typically, uh, um, yeah, typically fawns are the big, the big uh, they, they're the ones that, that predators put the most pressure on. Um, Historically, here in the eastern part of the state, uh, you know, coyotes would be the number one predator on fawns, and uh, most of us that are out and about know his, in the last 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, our coyote populations have been down greatly, primarily because of uh, mange. Um, so, as, as population, we've had, you know, s seems like more popu more uh, reports of coyotes throughout the last couple of years. Um, we'll see if, if they do have an impact, but. At least in eastern Nebraska, coyotes are the main predator on on deer fawn. Yeah. Yeah. And and for the most part, um, a lot of predation issues can be tracked back to habitat um, issues as well. Where you've got good habitat, generally predation. I mean, if you've got good expansive fawning habitat, then um, then predation isn't going to be a, an issue. For the most part, I mean, there's there's ups and downs in that. Yeah, yeah, we, we, oh, repeat the question for YouTube. Uh, it's asking if we, we track our uh, doe age um, structure in, in the harvest, and we, we do. I haven't um, crunched all of that just yet. Um, and we, there was a, a stretch of years where we didn't, and so some of that data is kind of intermittent, and not all of our check stations um, do as much as maybe they could or should. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely something we try to look at um, in that. I don't, I don't have any of that to <laughs> share with you, but we do look at it. Most of those were all the same, kind of okay. the same. All right. Yeah, mountain lion control on this part of the state. Uh, as you know, there's going to be a mountain lion season in the western, very northwestern part of the state. Um, otherwise, the rest of the state, we're in a monitoring and research phase. We had to do a lot of extensive monitoring research in the western, northwestern part of the state to evaluate our populations so we can have responsible hunting seasons. Throughout the north central, we're undergoing that, and, and in fact, statewide. So, you know, mountain lions uh, are being monitored, researched as much as we can. Uh, we have a mountain lion uh, management plan now, and so uh, yeah, we have a Sam Wilson with the, would be the one to visit with primarily on that, on the, the mountain lion side of things. He deals with them every day. Yep. So if one, if uh, a guy catching one in his livestock or killing his livestock or you feel threatened by it, uh, what trail are you going to be in if you wind up killing it? Uh, yeah, well that that happens, you know, occasionally throughout the state, and that's part of the response plan, Alicia. Statutorily. Yep. Stat. Yeah. Statutorily. Uh, so it. Yep. 
Yep, it's within your statutory rights to, to you know, kill any mountain lion, taking livestock or attempting to take, or human. Yes, livestock or human safety. Yep. Listen, maybe you can. Ad- <coughs> yeah. I'll speak up and say, because I'm the guy that was front page of the paper. I had an internet hack and everything else, paid for the deal, went out. All the money went to mountain lion research. It's political, so it's earnings out there. Sure. We don't have the guts to stand up there right now. That's the, that's the bottom line. Three days till the bus In fact, the mountain lion plates, the money goes to education on those youth. Re- youth Youth conservation education, but yeah, but uh, I mean they, they won't yeah. even acknowledge that you know they have a game program where they list the top ten animals or everything. They were glad to take the money and do all that, but they weren't. They won't even acknowledge that the top three lions were killed in the state. They won't even. It's all political. I, I call it the same old so I call it but all over. Yep. Question. Uh, I'm not sure. It was put in there for youth conservation education. Yep. The money goes to youth conservation education. Yep. Yes, the question was, for those who didn't hear it, uh, with the, regards to the landowner permits, currently they're, you know, it, it's in statute, they're half the number of the regular permits, the number or the quota. Um, if landowners were allowed to hunt land within the unit, um, would there be any repercussions or uh, would there be any alterations of that permit quota? And I mean, that would be one of the big things we'd have to look at is if if that was enacted what would be the what what else would be affected so I would I would expect that there would have to be modifications to acreage requirements number of permits uh, you know season structures uh, a lot of that would have to be looked at and it all could be impacted so it it could potentially flood the market for landowner permits in the in the unit Yeah, it varies by unit. Some units they fill up immediately, and others they don't. Some of them. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, I guess we discuss you know options every year, but uh, at this at this point, that's the way the landowner elk is and, and is going to be. So. Yeah. Yeah, the question was if there's any way to get away from the January uh, antlerless rifle season. Two guys today that are already got their dogs out fighting the shed. Yep. And I know the people that have shot decent bucks that like the farmers plus the does that are pregnant. Yep. It just seems like if you're going to do that, it'd be better in, in that early season. Um, it, it seems that way, but in fact, January is the main part of our antlerless harvest. Uh, the percentage of bucks harvested is, what is it? Well, of our overall harvest, it's only like 1.1% um, of shed of bucks. bucks are, are shot on hand focused tags. Yep. And so it's a, it's a pretty minimal impact. It does yep. happen. It's an, it's an unfortunate side effect of yep. the pattern that season when it is. Yep. It's an unfortunate side effect. information on the teletracks. Yep, on, the, on our, our check station. Or yep. I think information that was pretty high on it. Well, it, it's quite possible. Our data is only as good as what people um, report, but yeah. I mean, they, they, there's there's nothing that can come back on them if, for uh, reporting and harvesting a buck on one of those permits, yeah. or a, a shed buck, I should say, because yeah. yeah. it's, it's, it's illegal deer to kill on an animal tag. But I think his point is, during the January season, a lot of Bucks have already shed their antlers, yeah. and you've got pregnant does. Well, you've you, got pregnant yeah, does we in have, November firearms. And we have pregnant does during you the December season. Yeah. Antlers, does. Your best chance of doing that is during the firearm deer season. Because generally, the does will all be together with hogs. So your chances of getting a doe mm -hmm. are Well, it's it's quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. I guess at this point, in my opinion, um, I, I feel the January season is still still valuable in our in our antlerless harvest. There's a lot of antlerless harvest in January, um, and it, it, we we talk about it every year about how long that should be and, and you know that type of stuff. So I'm not going to say it's going to keep you know last forever, but it it is a valuable opportunity to harvest antlerless deer, particularly in in the units where they have uh, winter winter herding and, mig and, uh, and migration into other areas. So. We reduced antlerless tags in the Elkhorn unit uh, primarily because of the extensive habitat changes that took place over the last 10 years. Um, and we reduced them that, those antlerless permits on purpose to concentrate our harvest on the river permits. We wanted more folks to use those river permits where the deer populations was highest. And that's why we reduced the, those regular unit-wide season choice permits. Um, Not, no, well, maybe the eastern Missouri River, some of that is is the reservation property, but the whole Elkhorn River east to west so runs, yeah. yeah. What I mean is that, yep. that strip along the river runs straight down, they clean them out. Jeez, I think I checked this out there. I mean, you know, it's, it's heavily on it. Yep. So I don't, see how, I don't see how they can base that on, yep. on that unit. That's about it, I guess, for the night. No more new questions. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, thank you, folks. Uh, we'll stick around and visit, too, afterwards. And just uh, on January 2nd, uh, there's going to be a, a big game meeting in Sydney. And that's going to be on YouTube Live as well. So uh, 
sure to be some great questions and discussion out there. So if you get a chance, tune in on that one because it will be a, a whole different aspect on big game management in Nebraska. It will kind of showcase the diversity of big game in Nebraska. So yep. thank you, everybody, and thanks, everybody, for showing up. We appreciate it. Phone is my mic. Okay. Yeah.